Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Grant. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, and before we get started, I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, in particular, The Amazing World of Radio, where each week we bring you a story starring Ilona Massey in an espionage drama, uh, currently uh, set during the World War II era. Uh, and you can check all those out, amazing.greatdetectives.net, along with all of our past series, all the episodes we've recorded uh, this year and so much more, including tributes to Jack Webb, Kirk Douglas, and as well as our summer of Bogart and our summer of Angela Lansbury. So check all that out at amazing.greatdetectives.net, and remember our World War II podcast at thewar.greatdetectives.net. And also uh, be sure and check out the video version of this podcast, videotheater.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for the airmail mystery. Now, we played this a couple years ago, uh, starting in May of 2018. It was actually very well received, and we're replaying it because when we played it the first time, we had 11 episodes of the 13 in the series, and we were missing parts 7 and part 10, uh, part 7 I didn't feel was uh, important, but missing part 10 I felt like things had happened in the story, and while I, I it could piece together what was going on, uh, it kind of felt like, uh, yeah, we were missing something and it would be, you know, more complete if we could hear, you know, that 10th part. Now, the airmail mystery was released in 1932. That's the date on the transcription. We don't have more specifics. So this was uh, fairly uh, fairly early. I don't know who was in the cast. Uh, there was actually a movie serial uh, known as the airmail mystery, but with an entirely different plot and cast of characters. Uh, so... We've got a limit of what we know, but this is one of the earliest uh, radio programs that we played. So let's go ahead and take a listen to the first two episodes. It's no use, Mr. Powers. We haven't heard a peep from him since he reported his motor cut. I said try him again. Yes, sir. Metropolitan Airport to Andrews in 601. Metro calling Andrews in 601. Go ahead. Uh, 
That's no use, sir. We can't get a word. Get Summers in 6.30. Find out if he's seen anything yet. Yes, sir. Maisie. Yes, sir. Get A, your hanger. Find out who service Andrew's ship before I've left and uh, send them into my office. You get Summers? I'm trying now. Metropolitan to Summers in 6.30. Metro to Summers in 6.30. Go ahead. Summers to Metro. Summers to Metro. Go ahead. I got him, Mr. Powers. Good. Ask him if he's seen anything of Andrews. Metro to Summers. Chief wants to know, have you sighted Andy yet? Go ahead. Summers to Metro. Visibility up here, very bad. Flying 3,500 feet. Training, very dark. Nothing yet. Get his location. Metro... Metro, what is your position? Go ahead. Two minutes south, Queen Peak. Country very rough. Don't dare get much lower. And see Peak and on Sentinel Hill from here. That's all. Twin Peaks and Sentinel, huh? All right, tell him to come on in. Get that mechanic, Maisie? Yes, sir. He's on his way, Mr. Powers. Get the directors of this airline down to my office right away. Get them out of bed if you have to, but get them down. Send that mechanic to my office when he comes. Yes, sir. Metropolitan to Summers. Chief says, come on in. Don't take any chances. Here's the weather. Visibility about half mile. Ceiling 200 feet. Surface wind 30 miles. Uh, show him in, and uh, get his service record out of the file. I want to see it. Yes, sir. This way, please. You're the uh, night mechanic in A hangar? Yes, sir. What's your name? It's Gerald, sir. Mm. New man, huh? Yes, sir. Who hired you? Roby, sir. Field operations manager, huh? How long have you been with Trans-American? About three weeks, sir. Did you service Andrew's ship tonight before he started out? Yes, sir. How? Well, I gave it the usual inspection, sir, just like always. Did you, uh, check the mags? Yes, sir. Why? What's happened? I'll tell you what's happened. Andrews was bucking this storm over Twin Peaks when his motor cut on him. It's the last we've heard. Motor cut? That's what I said. He radioed that much to us, and that's all we've had from him. Gee. I guess you know that makes the third ship we've lost in three weeks. Yes, sir. And uh, they're all out of a hangar. I guess you know that too, don't you? Yes, sir. You're the man that's responsible for those ships, Fitzgerald. Three ships. $80,000 worth of airplanes in three weeks. All three on your ship. Out of your hangar. What's your explanation? Well, I don't know what to say, sir. I gave them all the standard inspection. Mags, switches, lines, tanks. Everything was all right, sir. They turned up when they left here. Is that all? Yes, sir. All right. You're fired. What, sir? I said you're fired. Mr. Powers, uh, don't you think that's just a bit hard? Why is it? I'll show this entire organization that I don't intend to put up with inefficiency around here. Lord knows the aviation industry is having a hard enough time as it is. Trans-American is going ahead and we can't do it by losing planes. That's all. Sir, how do you figure it was my fault? I don't want to argue this matter with you, Fitzgerald. We've lost three ships out of your hangar in three weeks. The pilots all said the motor cut out on them. You were paid to see that the motors performed. I did my best, sir. Your best wasn't enough. That's final. Yes, sir. Tell Maisie to come in as you go. Yes, sir. Anything from Andrews yet? Hmm. Now get Roby out of bed. Tell him to call out all the men on the night shift. Give them cars. Tell them to scour the country this side of Twin Peaks. Andrew's probably bailed out. You wanted me, Mr. Powers? How'd you figure that out? You get those uh, directors on the phone? Yes, sir. All except Mr. Kirby. His phone didn't answer. They said they'd be right over. Good. Summers is up looking for 601. I had him call in. 
The minute he's down, send him into my office. Yes, sir. That's all. Yes, sir. There's a young lady outside to see you. She's been waiting. A lady? What she want? Well, she wouldn't say, Mr. Powers. Her name is Delroy. Delroy. Well, send her in. This way, please. Mr. Powers? Yes. I'm Irene Delroy. Well, what about it? What do you want? I want to talk to you, Mr. Powers. Sorry, Miss Delroy. I'm very busy. Call for an appointment tomorrow. I'm sorry to inconvenience you, but I want to talk to you tonight. It's business. It's 10.45. I have an important meeting. You'll have to wait. Sorry, Mr. Powers. I'm sure your board of directors won't mind waiting a few minutes when they find you're dealing with the government. The government? Yes, Mr. Powers. I'm from the Department of Justice. Trans-American lost its third ship tonight... How do you know that? Details are out of place at this time. I want to know where this ship was last reported. Well, uh, just why should you or the Department of Justice be interested in our ships? The Department is not interested in your ships, Mr. Powers, unless your ships carry government mail. Hmm. I see. Well, uh, you have nothing to worry about. They'll find the mail in the wreckage. I don't doubt that. But I rather doubt if you'll find the $30,000 in government securities which was included in the shipment. What? Your ship carried $30,000 in negotiable securities tonight. You mean to say that... I have said nothing other than that. Eight days ago, a similar shipment was carried. Your ship crashed, the mail was recovered, but the shipment was missing. Why was no report made to me at that time? That has no bearing on this case. Twenty-one days ago, you lost another plane. Included in the mail shipment was $5,000 in currency for an upstate bank. It was not in the mail when the wreckage was found. You mean that our ships are being deliberately wrecked? You may draw your own conclusions, Mr. Power. Now, that's, uh, that's number 630 coming in. Send him to look for Andrew. I, uh, I hardly know what to make of your story, Miss Delroy. I rather expected it would surprise you. The other gentlemen are here, Mr. Powers. Oh, send them in. My directors, Miss Delroy, you'll remain? Yes. Good. I want them to hear your story. <laughs> Good evening, Campbell. <laughs> Mr. Hardy, Good Lewis, evening. come in, gentlemen. What's the meaning of this, Powers? What's up? What's so all fired important that you have to get us out on a night like this? Don't start spouting about the weather. I've had my hands full tonight. Gentlemen... Trans American has lost another ship. What? what another another word? Why, I, I thought that would bring you around. Now find chairs and sit down. What ship? One of the new fast mails, our latest low wing job. Why, we just took delivery on that ship last month. Why, we stand to lose thirty thousand dollars. Why, my goodness. Not only that, gentlemen. We stand to lose our mail contract with the government. Why, that we can't draw the business. Our contract? Powers, I demand an explanation. Well, don't burst a blood vessel. You'll get it. You'll get all you want. I want you to meet Miss Delroy from the Department of Justice. It seems that they want an explanation, too. Delroy, these are the directors of the Trans-American Airlines. Tell them what you told me. There's little to tell us yet, gentlemen. The department has reason to believe that your ships are being deliberately and very cleverly wrecked by a ring of mail thieves. Why, that's deliberately impossible. On what does your department base its uh, contention? On the fact that all three of the ships which your company has lost in the last three weeks carried government securities which were easily negotiable. And on the fact that all ships were lost within a radius of one mile of each other. Where did we lose the fast mail tonight, Powers? Somewhere between Twin Peaks and Signal Hill, according to Andrew's radio report. You remember, gentlemen, that the other ships were lost at the same point. Miss Delroy is right. What did Andrew's report? Didn't have time to report much. Said his motor cut on him, that's all. He was in bad country. I suppose he bailed out. We haven't found him yet. Say, Andrews was piloting those other ships when they cracked, wasn't he? That's precisely why I called this meeting tonight, gentlemen. Andrews is our oldest pilot. Possibly our best. I'm going to let him and every man connected with the dispatching of the eastbound planes go. I honestly believe the only way we can wipe out this thing is to clean house. I hardly believe that will solve your troubles, Mr. Powers. What do you mean? Whoever is responsible for your troubles will not let trivial things stand in his way. If you want to see your ship carried through on schedule, 
You must cooperate with us to apprehend the criminal. Well, how do you propose to go about it? Well, I've made no decision along those lines as yet. I merely want you to assist in placing all information that we may need before us. Well, certainly. You'll find that we're... Uh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Powers. Well? We just got a call from the State Highway Patrol over near Kingman that they just picked Andrews up on the highway. He's okay, sir. Bailed out. He's okay, huh? Well, tell him to bring him in. I uh, presume we want to hear from him. Right, gentlemen? I tell you, Andrews knows something about this. How do we know his motor cut out on him? We have only his word to go on. Suppose it didn't. Then what? You mean to imply, Powers, that there's some connection between Andrews and the airmail thieves? Why not? We've lost three ships counting the one tonight. Andrews was the pilot in each case. The only man in the ship. You don't hear about the motors on our passenger lines giving trouble. Why should the mail planes? Most of all, why should Andrews get all the bad breaks? But, Powers, don't lose sight of the fact that heretofore Andrews has been our best pilot. He's been with us since we organized this company. Why should he want to deliberately wreck $80,000 worth of our ships? What is your opinion, Miss Delroy? Well, you should not overlook the fact that in each case there was a valuable transfer of government securities. Uh, I know how you feel about Andrews, Temple. You watched him grow up and aided him where you could. He's engaged to marry your daughter. But men have been known to crack before, especially where the stakes were high. What do you mean, Powers? Just this. I know that for the past few months, Andrews has been trying his luck in the market. He's been gambling on rather risky stocks. Now, I'll tell you something you don't know. Two days ago, Andrews sold all his holdings in Transamerican. How do you know that? The broker who has been handling Andrews' account told me. What's more, he told me that Andrews is hard up. It's preposterous. And he is not the man to gamble away what little money he has saved? I can show you the stock transfer tomorrow. The trouble with you, Temple, is that you're too soft-headed for a job like this. Soft-headed, eh? Mm. Listen. I believe we will get farther if you gentlemen will assist me by answering a few questions. Uh, sorry, Miss Delroy. Mr. Powers believes that the pilot might have had something to do with this case. Can you tell me, Mr. Powers, if there was any way for Andrews to know that the particular shipment he was carrying was of unusual value? You mean, uh, any way he could know that he was carrying securities? Yes, that's the question. Uh, I don't know. I, I suppose he could have found out some way... Where do you receive the mail from the post office? Just outside this door in the receiving room. Mm -hmm. How long does it take uh, there before it is loaded onto the plane? Oh, not long. Possibly 20 minutes. I see. Can you tell me, is the mail ever opened or sorted in the receiving room before it is loaded into the plane? Very seldom. Sometimes if there's too much weight in one bag, we divide it into two containers. However, this is done before the proper authorities. Do you remember if the eastbound pouch was opened here tonight before it was loaded into the plane? Yes, it was opened and divided while the post office men were here. Who ordered it opened? I did. For a reason? Yes. We were carrying a rather large load of express on tonight's eastbound. I wanted to distribute the load more evenly. These new fast mails have a, ten a tendency to be a bit nose-heavy as it is. Were you present when the pouch was emptied? I believe I was, at least uh, part of the time. Well, did you see the government shipment? If I did, I didn't recognize it. Can you tell us if Mr. Andrews was present when the pouch was emptied? Well, that I can't say. He may have been. Then again, he may not. Yes? There's a gentleman here to see you, Mr. Powers, a reporter. What do you want? I don't know, sir. Tell him we have nothing to say. Well, that's no way to receive a representative of the press, gentlemen. What do you want? I'm Gifford of the Star. See, I hear you lost another ship tonight. Jimmy! Irene! <laughs> uh, I knew it. I knew it, sure as shooting. I had a hunch there was something back of these crashes, and seeing you here makes me sure of it. Jimmy, I thought you were still in New York. Hardly. I'm a, I'm a roving sort of fellow. Can't stay in one place very long. You've got to keep traveling to keep ahead of these news hounds, you know. Say, let me look at you. Still as good looking as ever. Jimmy, please. Did you get my letter? Jimmy, we're here on serious business. Oh, all right. Say, what's up? Nothing as yet. And see here, Gifford, if you'll come around in the morning, we'll furnish you with a statement. Right now, we have other things on our minds. Exactly. And I'm thinking that the other things you mention will be more important than that statement you'll give me in the morning. That's enough. You weren't invited, so get out. Now, Powers, you forget you're talking to the press. 
You wouldn't want me to print a story saying that an official of Transamerican threw a reporter out on his ear, would you? I said get out of this office. Hey, uh, now, Mr. Gifford, if you have a few questions that won't take too long, perhaps we could... Uh... Fine. Now, I knew you'd be only too glad to help me out. You, uh, you lost another ship tonight. Now, what was the cause? The pilot reported motor trouble. Anybody hurt? No, it was a mail plane. No passengers. I presume the pilot bailed out. Who was the pilot? Andrews. You mean Andy Andrews, the war flyer? I believe he had some war experience. Hmm, that's the third time he's ripped the sack, isn't it? And what is your mission, Miss Delroy? That doesn't concern you, Gifford. And why not? Here I find the directors of Trans-American Airlines closeted with one of the best operators of the Department of Justice, and you say it doesn't mean anything. I can't <laughs> say anything as yet, Jimmy. Well, I see. It's just one another one of those things, isn't it? Mr. Andrews is back, Mr. Powers. Oh. Mr. Well, well, bring him in. Bring him in. We'll find out something about this. Uh, oh. oh, sit down, Andrews. You look all in. Oh, I am. Tired as a dog and soaked to the skin. Anybody got a drink? Here you are, mister. Help yourself. Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is great. Oh, aren't you going to join me? No, thanks. I, I only carry it for emergencies. Well, your first aid kit is serving its purpose this time. Say, what? Well, what's the matter? Oh, I'm sorry. Your face looks familiar. I was just trying to place it. My name's Gifford. I'm a reporter. Well, glad to know you, Gifford. Reporter, eh? I suppose there'll be a flock of you fellas around. And we'll have to ask you to leave, Gifford. This conference is to be private. Oh, that's distressing. I had hoped to lend my assistance. It won't be needed. I don't see any harm in letting Mr. Gifford stay, gentlemen. I've worked on cases with him before, and I'm sure we can rely on his discretion. We're going to discuss some very private matters, Miss Delroy. I don't intend to see the press destroy confidence in our pilots or our ships. On the other hand, I believe we can persuade Mr. Gifford to build up that confidence rather than destroy it. Oh, very well. What's up? Why all the hubbub? You carried a registered package tonight, Andrews. Well, what about it? I can't fly a ship without a motor, can I? Besides, you'll find that mail when you find the ship. I dumped the tanks and cut the switch. <laughs> I'm beginning to believe somebody has it in for me. Bailing out of three ships in a month. That's precisely why we're here. What happened? You know, that's the funny thing about it. It was practically the same as happened when I was flying 618 about a week ago. How do you mean? What well, was that? You see, I was fighting rain and low ceiling over Twin Peaks. But aside from that, everything seemed okay. I was right on time, and the buzzer showed I was on course, according to the radio beacon. Then all of a sudden, the motor cut, clean as a whistle. I pumped the throttle, but no soap. I switched on to both mags, but still, she wouldn't pick up. I could see there wasn't a chance to land the ship, so I did the only thing there was to do. Dumped the tanks, cut the switch, radioed Metro, and bailed. That's all. What seemed to be the trouble with the motor, old man? Ignition. If it had been gas, the motor would have spluttered once or twice at least. How high were you when you were flying? Mm, about 4,800. That's only 1,800 above the pass. Was your motor turning up okay when you left? Sure. 1,700 RPM on the ground. That's plenty of suck. Had you checked ignition cables? No, why should I? That's Fitzgerald's job. Say, what'd he say about it? Fitzgerald swore that the ship had been thoroughly checked before you left. Where is this Fitzgerald? I let him go. I hold him jointly responsible for tonight's crash. And the other party? Andrews. Me? Say, what's the idea? Just because I don't ride a plane to the ground, you blame me. Listen, Powers, I've put every plane we've got through on schedule in all sorts of weather. I brought him in here with a motor pounding like a boiler factory. But when a motor cuts completely on me over that country, I bail out, see? And rightly, too. Rightly? Do you mean to tell me that you approve of Andrew's action? Naturally. What else would you expect a man to do? Go down with the ship? Oh, uh, don't get soft, Temple. Tonight, Andrews, you cracked the third ship in three weeks in the same place. Well, what about it? Why don't you find out why the motor on those ships stopped dead in a mackerel? For the love of Mike, do you think I like to bail out in the mountains? Do you think it's fun to risk my neck coming down in a chute in that kind of country? In those three trips, you carried $65,000 in government securities. Well, what if I did? What of it? Those securities weren't with the mail when it was recovered from the wreckage. Now I get what you're driving at. In other words, Mr. Powers... You're trying to infer that I took them, is that it? Oh, well, I didn't say that, Andrews, but uh, on the other hand, we know that you have been plunging in the market. Well, what about it? Is there any law against a pilot playing the market? Everybody else does. Yeah, but you sold your holdings in Trans-American Airlines. Sure, why shouldn't I? The stock was mine. You admit you were hard up for money? Sure, I was a sucker and they cleaned me. But I didn't have anything to do with that mail. Hmm. Perhaps I'd better introduce you to Miss Delroy here. She's with the Department of Justice. It will be for her to decide. Uh, who is it? Mr. 
Powers. Yeah, well, what is it? Mr. Powers, I've just found the wreckage of 601. Oh, good. Andrews dumped the tanks and cut the switch. Now we'll see if we can find any part of that mail. I don't think you will, sir. Why? Why shouldn't we find it? Because Mr. Fitzgerald found the ship, sir, and reported it was completely burned to pieces. Welcome back. Well, there are a lot of interesting things, you know, in this episode. I, I did like the way that, uh, you know, they treated Andy Andrews investing, you know, money in the stock market, you know, like he had spent his money playing the horses. It's important to remember that this was, you know, a, less than three years, most likely, after the stock market crash of October of 1929. So there were a lot of people for whom that was the sentiment. You know, it would be better if you, you know, go down to Hialeah and, you know, put the money on a horse uh, rather than putting it in uh, stocks, as people were very skittish about the market. Mostly what this episode does is just a lot of setting the stage. And I should say in these first two episodes, we just really do get a sense of, of the overall mystery, the facts of the case, and also meeting a lot of the players. And I think it's also important that we do get a bit of a sense of atmosphere. This would definitely have been really interesting to people back in uh, 1932, just because aviation at this point was still a relatively new industry. And here we're getting a new twist on an old crime. And so far, we've got some interesting uh, questions posed, and we're going to, I think, have even more as the uh, story proceeds. So I hope you'll be with us uh, as we resume next week. But I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Joe, Patreon supporter since April, currently supporting us at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Well, that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for The Man Called X, and we'll be back next Tuesday, another episode of The Airmail Mystery. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.